Good evening. I'm going to ask that you take your Bibles and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. I want to uh, begin something this evening, uh, not something that we're going to be doing on a Sunday night to Sunday night basis, but more of something I'm hoping to do on a monthly basis, and that is spend some time with you considering one word. The one word we want to consider this evening is the word workmanship. We're going to find it in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. I think a study like this would be fruitful. It can be beneficial because sometimes we read the words of Scripture and we don't fully grasp what that word is conveying, what ideas it is telling, what truths it is revealing. And um, one instance that pops out of my mind is uh, some time ago, Chris had done a Wednesday night devotional and he was looking at 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 6 and he was looking at the word departure and how that word departure really was a nautical term talking about um, loosening the ship and going off to another place it wasn't just vanishing off to nowhere but arriving or leaving with the intent to arrive somewhere else and uh, that was a word I hadn't really considered that way and really taking the time since then to consider it that way has been fruitful for me and this word workmanship we're going to see here in Ephesians 2 and verse 10 uh, has really been the same for me. It's a word I haven't spent much time considering. It hasn't been a word that I've spent much time thinking over and uh, trying to wrestle with what it truly conveys. But recently, I've been doing so. And so hopefully, uh, we'll be able to do that on a monthly basis. Also, just by way of reminder, um, if you would like, I would encourage you to put in questions in the question box. Uh, right now, I think we have two, and uh, that's not going to be enough for the end of this month, so hopefully you can fill it up with questions. I'm going to print off more question sheets um, this week, and so stock it up, please. Ephesians 2 and verse 10. Let's read it together. It says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, Paul is speaking this in the context of how we have gone from a lost position. We've gone from being dead in our sins to alive together in Christ. Ephesians 2 and verse 5. And we're alive together in Christ, not because of meritorious words that anyone may brag or anyone may boast. Verse 9. But we're, we're in Christ. We're alive in Christ because of his graciousness. His graciousness has made us alive. His graciousness has made us his workmanship. As I think about workmanship, the idea that comes into my mind is someone who lays down a, a blueprint. A blueprint for something that he desires to make. I wouldn't call anything that I make on accident my workmanship. I wouldn't call anything that I, that I just throw together my workmanship. <laughs> I would only use that phrase if I'm referring to something that was planned out. And so as I think about workmanship, it conveys to me, number one, that the church was conceived in the mind of God. The church was conceived. It was part of a plan. It wasn't a mistake, as some would say. Uh, the the premillennialists would say that the church was established as God's plan B because the Jews had thwarted his plan A. It wasn't a contingency plan. It wasn't just a backup in case everything went wrong. It was in the mind of God from the foundations of the world, Ephesians 1 and verse 4. When Jesus was talking about his goal, what he was going to do, and what, what was his intent, in Matthew 16 and verse 18, he said, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. He didn't say, if all else fails... I'll put together a church. If all else fails, I'll put together a group of people and they're going to do a work for me. No, he said, I will build my church. It was intended. It was thought out. It was planned for. The Lord planned for the church. The Lord planned for the church and, and just that idea of planning, conception, puts into my mind the, the idea of purpose. The Lord had a purpose for the church. The Lord still has a purpose for the church. 
For instance, Matthew 5 and verse 13, we are the salt of the earth. Well, what's the purpose there? Uh, salt has that preservation aspect of it. We're preserving. And we've talked about that a lot in our Bible class in the book of Genesis. How the righteous preserve the world. It could be the fact that our presence here is what keeps the wrath of God from being poured out upon all the earth. Uh, you think about salt. You have, you have the taste. The Christians to be delightful. Our words are to be seasoned with salt. Gracious. Colossians 4 and verse 6. Uh, think about salt. You have purification. Pure salt purifies itself. Uh, whenever we would go in school to uh, the church in Fruitvale, each year they had a student lectureship. And up there in Fruitville is the Morton uh, Rock Salt Factory or mine, rock mine, something like that. But anyway, they have this massive rock of salt just standing there. And you know what people do whenever they visit it? They lick it. Miriam just squirmed. <laughs> Miriam just squirmed because she goes, that's disgusting. You know why it's actually safe to do it? Because whenever you lick it, it purifies itself. It's a pure rock of salt. It cleans it itself. And, and Katie, does, Katie doesn't believe. She'll, she'll Google it later uh, this evening. But salt purifies. We are purifying the world. How do we do that? Through the message that we share with the world. The message that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Think about the purpose of the church. The, the church is the light of the world, Matthew 5 and verse 14. We are providing the light to the path. We know that there are two paths set before men, the pathway of righteousness, the path of this world. The path of this world is wide, it's easy, but its end is destruction. The pathway of righteousness is, ne uh, righteousness is narrow, it's difficult, but it leads to life. And our responsibility the whole way is to light the way so that people go on the narrow way, so that people choose life. Think about the church, the Christian. The Christian is a vessel. 1 Timothy chapter uh, 2 in verse 21. Actually, 2 Timothy chapter 2 in verse 21. We have an opportunity set before us. Are we going to be a vessel of honor? Or are we going to be a vessel that is not meant for honor? We would like to be a vessel for honor. How do we do that? Go back to the idea of where the light of the world, Matthew 5 and verse 16, concludes with the fact that we are doing good works before men... So they may glorify our Father. That's how we be a vessel of honor. You think about what else the church is. What else Christians are. Matthew 4 and verse 19. We are fishers of men. We're going out adamantly seeking men to be saved. Seeking men who are willing. We are, uh, we are farmers in some aspect. Mark chapter 4. Going out and sowing the seed in the morning. Day after day after day. Hoping. Trusting. That if we place the seed into the good soil, that the word of God will take root in people's hearts and yield change. The Christian is the spokesman of God. Ephesians 6 and verse 20, Paul says that we are ambassadors of Christ. We are speaking on behalf of the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one in whose hand is all of creation. The one who said that he will come again. Nobody will know the hour. The one who said that he will destroy this world by fire. We speak on his behalf, again, for the purpose of his glorification and for the purpose of bringing lost men to Christ. Think about what else the church is uh, known for. The church is a uh, purpose to be the way. In Acts chapter 9 and verse 2, when Saul was going to Damascus, he was looking for those who belonged to the way. Jesus said in John 14 and verse 6, I am the truth. Uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In the same way that Christ is the light of the world, we are the light of the world. In the same way that Christ is the way, we are the way. We are the way showing men to the grace of God. We are the bulwark of truth, 1 Timothy 3 and verse 15. We are set for the defense of the gospel, as Paul said in Philippians 1 and verse 14. And so when Christ and, and the Father and the Spirit, they set forth a plan for, for the church, they didn't do so as just a group of people who were meaningless. He didn't just do so as, as maybe a backup plan in case things failed. He did so with every bit of intention and showing forth his glory 
and in providing salvation to lost men. So as I think about his workmanship, me, you, the church being his workmanship, we were intended in the mind of God. Second thing this shows me, the idea of his workmanship, it shows me that the church was crafted. It shows me that the church was crafted. A lot of people use this mindset of just as I am, right? And we, we would say, yes, the sinner come to the Lord. But who's going to receive grace? Is it the sinner who goes about and commits that sin once again? No, it's the person who has the genuine change in their heart. 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 10, For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to life without regret, but worldly grief produces death. The, 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 the church isn't a group of imperfect people who strive to be imperfect. The church is a bunch of imperfect people who have been molded into his perfect image. The church is crafted. It's not sloppily thrown together. It's not, it's not riddled with sin. It is beautiful. It's beautiful because it bears the image of her crafter, her craftsman. Romans 8 and verse 29 tells us that we have all been conformed into his image. That means we took off the image of self, took off the image of the world, the image of sin, the image of Satan, and we put on his image. He molded us. He crafted us. And the, the church, his craftsmanship, it bears his image, and his image is beautiful. It tells us in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 27, as Paul is talking about the church being the bride of Christ, it says that we, the church, are unblemished, spotless, without sin. Now, how is that possible? It's only possible because we bear his image. We're like him through his sacrifice. Um, you, you see that in 1 John 1, verses 7 through 9. We're continually purified by his blood. The third thing that craftsmanship brings to my mind is that it shows that the church is cared for. I've never known anyone to spend time working on something and not care what happens to it later. I've never known anyone to invest in something and not care if it fails. I've never known anyone to, uh, you know, restore an old car and then not care if a kid goes by and scrapes it up. I've never known anyone to, to take the time to put forth the energy to show forth the love that it takes to bring someone out of darkness into light and then allow someone to just walk in and ruin it. That's not what the Lord has done. We are his craftsmanship, his workmanship. We're cared for. He watches over us. He cherishes us. He guards us. John 10 and verse 28. He is the good shepherd, the good shepherd who lies down at the door. He protects us. We're in his hand. No one can reach in and snatch us out. No one can reach in and seize our crown. No one can hinder us from the love of God. Romans 8 and verse 31. Nothing can separate us. Why? Because he is guarding us. He is over us. Psalm 46 and verse 1 as our refuge. He is our pillar of strength. He is everything about who we are. He is the one through him we exist. Colossians 1 and verse 17. He is our very being. He guards us. He cleanses us. Psalm 119 and verse 9, the psalmist asked the question, How shall a young man keep his way pure? He says, By guarding it according to your word. Then he says in Psalm 119 and verse 11, Your word I have stored up in my heart that I might not sin against you. He keeps us clean. He's provided us the tool to stay clean. He's provided us the equipment to stay his. You think about Ephesians chapter 5. It tells us Ephesians chapter 5, I believe verse 26, that we have been purified by the baptism of his word. He's cleansed us. He watches over us. Again, 1 John 1, verses 7 and 9, the idea that he continually cleanses us. Those who walk in the light as he is in the light. Those of his craftsmanship that are portraying themselves as that craftsmanship. Those who choose to be that vessel of honor. Think about this idea of being cherished. 
we're, we're going to be held in honor. I know sometimes we don't think about that. Sometimes we think of it as a strange idea, but we are going to be held in honor. Revelation 2 and verse 10, Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. 2 Timothy 4, verses 7 and 8, Paul said, I have finished the faith, or I have finished the race. I, I, I have held the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me, but all, only to me, but also those who, or all those who have loved his appearing, those who love him, they're going to receive the crown. And as we saw, I believe it was with the church in Philadelphia, the Lord said that there are going to be those who mock you. And what we're going to do on the day of judgment, we're going to set you before them and they are going to bow at your feet. You are going to receive honor, the honor that is due, not because of what you've done, but because of what he has done. Not because I am a masterpiece of my own doing, but because I'm a masterpiece of his doing. The Lord is going to hold us in honor. Now, I don't really have much this evening to share with you aside from that. Um, and I, I wanted to, uh, to speak maybe a little lesser this evening because I didn't want what I was saying to get lost in time. I, I wanted you to see how simple maybe it is, some of these words, and how deep some of these words might strike. The word of workmanship is a very deep word. It really conveys a lot about the beauty of the church. It really conveys a lot about me and you, what we mean to the Lord. Uh, you think about what the Lord said, you know, does not the Lord care for the lilies of the field? Does he not care for the sparrows? Do you not think he's going to care for you? The Lord cares for you. The Lord has always cared for you. The Lord has cared for you since the beginning, since you were even an inkling of thought in your parents' minds. The Lord has always watched over you. You think about, again, I'm, I'm going to talk about this word workmanship. This word workmanship is used very rarely in the church in the New Testament. But one of the occasions that it's used in the Old Testament, it's translated to the same Greek word in the Septuagint, is in Psalm 19, where it talks about the, the heavens, it talks about the stars. All those things that you and I, we go out at night and we marvel over. Recently, me and the kids were in Lakey, and while I was sitting in Lakey in my hammock, I look up at night, and I was just fascinated by the stars. It doesn't matter how old you get. You are always fascinated by the stars. It doesn't matter if you walk outside and you look at the same stars. You're still going to be fascinated. That's how we ought to be looking at the church. Sometimes we become caught up in the mundane activities, and sometimes we begin to look at the church as something ordinary. The church is not ordinary. Don't let it ever become ordinary in your mind. Always let it remain as what it is. It is workmanship. It is beautiful. It is cherished by God. He crafted it. We are to love it and cherish it ourselves. 1 Peter 2 and verse 17. Let's continue to pray for the church. Let's continue to pray that she, uh, that she remain strong. That she remain as beautiful as the Lord intended that she be. And let's continue to pray for her as she awaits her bridegroom. The Lord Jesus is coming, and whenever he comes, I want him to look at me as his workmanship. I don't want him to look at me as, as something that, uh, that doesn't come close to bearing his image. The only way we're going to bear his image is if we yield to him the things that are his. That was the, image, that was the lesson that uh, the Lord was teaching whenever he taught regarding that Coin, whose image does it bear? We bear the image of God in Genesis 1 and verse 27. And so let's honor him as he honored himself in the, in the man Christ Jesus. Let's be obedient even unto the point of death as Jesus was. Let's pray to him even as Jesus did. Let's worship him in all spirit and all truth as Jesus worshiped him. This evening, I want to offer the invitation for those who might have been falling short in this aspect of being his workmanship, being what God intended you to be. I understand we all struggle. Again, James 3 and verse 2 says we all struggle in many different ways. The great thing about the church, here's a, here's a great thing about this workmanship, a beautiful thing is you have a support system here. You have a family that cares about you deeply, and they want to get you to heaven and they want to help you with whatever it is. If we can help you and bear your burden, please let us do so. If you want to know about the Lord's church,
You want to know about salvation? The salvation that was poured out full and free on Calvary when the Lord was crucified and it was sealed whenever the tomb was sealed and he broke free from the tomb and he rose and he came to the right hand of the throne of God. That is the gospel message. God, it, or Christ is sitting at the right hand of the Father and he's coming back to claim his own. And if you want to be his own, you've got to repent and you've got to be baptized. You've got to repent. You've got to live as he lives. He's your Lord. You've got to live as your Lord intends. You've got to be baptized. You have got to put away the old man and rise a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. Walking in the newness of life, Romans 6 verses 3 and 4. And again, as I said earlier, the church will be honored. You will be honored. You will receive the crown of life. This evening, if there's anyone who needs the, the prayers or the help of the congregation, please come forward now. As together we stand and as we sing. <laughs>